The problem today in healthcare is that individuals, patients that have access to care uh, may receive more care than they need. Um, this may happen because they are diagnosed with conditions they don't have or the conditions that they have get treated to an extent that goes beyond what patients would choose if they knew the pros and cons of uh, the, the treatments and the procedures that they are exposed to. There is therefore a goal in healthcare today which is to right size the healthcare footprint on people's lives. And right now that healthcare footprint is too large and people are getting too much care. So one approach is to figure out with the patient uh, what are the goals of care? What are the preferences that patients have about how might they recover the health they've lost or maintain a level of health and function that allows them to achieve their goals and dreams? And in doing so, identify what is the least amount of health care, what is the least complexity of health care that they will need to endure in order to achieve those goals. That form of patient-centered care that allows patients to get not less than what they need and not more than what they want, that sort of Goldilocks uh, care, is what we're referring to as minimally disruptive medicine. And patients and caregivers have a, a given capacity to do all that work, but that's the same capacity they have to do the work of being a parent or a spouse or a teacher or a coach or a friend. And um, if those activities demand uh, that capacity, there will be less uh, to the activities of being a patient. So the job that we have in healthcare is to figure out how much capacity the patient has, and right now we do not know that, and we need to figure out how much uh, burden of treatment we can put on that capacity, how much work uh, can we give patients to do. And right now we also don't know, and we are not aware, of how much work it takes for patients to follow our advice and to take our treatment. So we are completely unaware of the capacity that patients have and of the workload that we put on that capacity. However, it is that balance of workload and capacity that determines whether patients can access care, use care, and establish the self-care practices that will allow them to have good outcomes. By being unaware, we oftentimes exceed the patient's capacity with our treatment, and when patients begin to pick and choose the treatments that they can implement, we start calling them non-compliant. On the treatment burden side, uh, we need to make sure that patients get the treatments they need for the conditions they have um, in order to achieve their goals. For many of the chronic conditions that we have, we express ourselves in terms of controlling their blood sugar or their blood pressure or their bone density. And these terms suggest to the patients that these are technical decisions, decisions that doctor you went to medical school to make, don't expect me to participate. And so we need to change our language to make sure that we prioritize in terms of what matters to the patient. And so to the patient, uh, there's been a study done by our Center for Innovation in Austin, Minnesota, looking at what matters to patients. And what matters to patients, in a nutshell, is their ability to do what they want to do. So if I'm, a care, if, if I'm the breadwinner for my family, I need to be able to continue to do that. Um, if I am a coach and that's what gives meaning to my life, I need to be able to show up to coach. If I'm a player, the same thing. If I'm, a, if I'm the spouse and if I'm the father, if I'm the teacher, if I'm the coach, these are all roles that I play. And I don't want health or health care to interfere with my ability to play those roles. So it's actually very interesting work that shows that people that are most disadvantaged, have lower socioeconomic status, less education, less resources, less capacity, accumulate mental and health uh, sorry, mental and physical comorbidities faster and earlier in their life than people that are more advantaged. So the people that have the most problems uh, also have the least resources to face those problems. So when we see patients, we may need to prioritize this idea of minimally disruptive medicine among those who have the least, uh, the least resources. But talking to them about uh, what, are, what are their goals and then trying to match what the treatments that we have available to those goals and figuring out prioritizing through those, the ones that will require less work, is the first step. We have failed noticing that the way we are organized today is not set up to be successful in delivering minimally disruptive medicine to these patients. What we are very successful at Mayo Clinic, however, is to organize and integrate the care that may be happening to patients across a number of conditions and diseases. Our ability to work on, on, a, on a teamwork fashion, it becomes essential to deliver care that manages how much we ask patients to do. But still, because we're not fully aware of 
how that translates in terms of work that the patient or the caregiver has to do. And because we're completely unaware for the most part on the patient's capacity, we still are not able to succeed in delivering minimally disruptive medicine. So it's very much both a research agenda and a practice agenda. So over the last year, we, pilot, uh, we piloted a, a, um, a very resource intensive, so we have like 20 people around our table working on individual patients that primary care clinicians identified as likely to be overwhelmed. In other words, likely to be ex experiencing quite a bit of treatment burden with very limited capacity. And again, in working through those patients, we understood that it didn't take 20 people around the table to fix their problem. It, take, it, it really takes a fundamental change in the delivery uh, system. Uh, one that connects the delivery system much more with community level resources and one that uh, calls for an enhanced level of care coordination that, uh, than the one that is currently in place uh, in primary care. For minimally disruptive medicine to work, there, there should be a relationship between the patient and their caregivers and the clinical team. The, the clinician and, and, and the team members, uh, which you most likely find in a primary care environment. And it is through that relationship, it is through that interaction that, that the clinical team becomes keenly aware of the values and context of the patient, because the patient tells them. And the patient becomes able to understand where the clinical team is coming from, and they can begin to have some common ground to discuss prioritization of care and some conf confidence in, in each other, trust in each other, so that the patient can bring up issues of uh, capacity contraction that may have occurred since the last visit. Patients have difficult time talking about their finances. Patients have difficult time talking about their uh, marital difficulties, their interpersonal challenges at home, but all of those things affect their ability to be good patients. Without that partnership, that relationship of trust, it's going, to be, it's going to continue to be difficult for clinical teams to be aware of the patient's capacity, and they will constantly make the mistake of overwhelming patients as they treat the conditions one by one. So the journey of mental disruptive medicine is one that is not only has to be uh, taken by the clinical teams, but it has to be a journey also taken with the patient. And so both have to do that work to achieve that sort of Goldilocks care that we're hoping for.